Welcome and thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about natural energy, such as oil and gas. As many of us probably have heard, and maybe some of you haven't, uh, we've kind of pretty much hit all the easy oil there is to get, and now it's time to get down and dirty and find some of the other stuff as we continue our dependence, especially here in America, on fossil fuels. On the Beyond 50 radio program today, we're going to be talking about the rapid spread of what's known as hydraulic fracturing or fracking. This has temporarily boosted U.S. natural gas and oil production. It's also sparked a massive environmental backlash in communities across the country. The fossil fuel industry is trying to sell fracking as the biggest energy development of the century. With slick promises of American energy independence and benefits to local economies. We're going to talk about what fracking actually is, how it works, and what it actually does to the environment and is this something that's really good to do, especially when you consider things like strip mining for coal or ore, for instance? On the program today, our guest, Richard Heinberg, he's the author of 10 previous books, including The Party's Over. And he's joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today to talk about his new book, Fracking for Shale, Gas, and Oil is No Cure at All. Snake Oil, How Fracking's False Promise of Plenty and Perils Our Future. Richard, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. It's good to be with you, Daniel. Now, how did you get started in this investigation into looking about what fracking was and what this is all about? Uh, well, you know, I, I've been writing about energy and energy policy for a, a long time now. And just over the last two, three years, we've seen an enormous uh, development take place here in the U.S. We've gone from talking about how we need to get off of fossil fuels. Even George W. Bush was saying we're addicted to oil. and This is a a, uh, national security problem as well as an economic problem and and an environmental problem. We have to do something about it. Well, that's all that's changed in the last two or three years because of fracking. Suddenly, because of the application of this new technology, uh, the claim is that America is in a new age of energy abundance. Uh, Natural gas production is at its highest level ever. Uh, U.S. oil production has been headed upward for the last couple of years, and there are claims that the U.S. is about to become um, energy independent as a result of this. So I wanted to find out if these claims were based on uh, good data. I wanted to find out what was actually going on with uh, the fracking industry, where it had come from, what, uh, what its uh, environmental and social consequences were. So I spent a few months digging, and, uh, and the book Snake Oil is a result of that research. Now tell us how you first got sort of on the trail of this, in a way that you could get the kind of information you presented in the book? Uh, well, I'm, I'm a senior fellow with a uh, nonprofit think tank called Post Carbon Institute. And, uh, and we, as an organization, were interested in this subject. So what we did was to organize a study. We, uh, uh, first, uh, one of our fellows, David Hughes, uh, is a a retired petroleum geologist who was a senior scientist for the Canadian Geological Survey. And, and for the government of Canada for many years, he would produce uh, on a routine basis um, uh, studies and reports looking at uh, fossil fuel uh, production and reserves. So he, he was perfectly uh, situated to, uh, to do this study for us. So we, uh, we bought the rights to data uh, drilling data on over 60,000 currently producing uh, shale gas and tight oil wells that have been horizontally drilled and fracked here in the United States. And we analyzed that data. We looked at initial production rates from each well. We looked at, uh, at subsequent production rates. How does production go up? Does it decline? By how much? How soon? And we looked at the geography of each and every well, where it was located in relation to uh, other wells and in relation to the the uh, geologic formations that uh, where shale gas and tight oil uh, are are known to exist and uh, and 
my book is really based on the the data from from that study, which reached some really astonishing conclusions because they fly in the face of the claims that are being made on almost a daily basis by the oil and gas industry with regard to the potential for shale gas and tight oil to fuel America in coming decades. Now, tell us exactly what fracking is. How does it work? Sure. Um, you know, fracking is, uh, is a, really a set of technologies, and hydrofracturing per se is a practice that's been around for decades, and it's used not just in shale gas and tight oil wells, but in lots and lots of conventional uh, oil and gas production as well. Uh, so what we're really talking about here, actually, is not just fracking per se. It's that suite of technologies that's been brought together that includes uh, horizontal drilling and the use of uh, a whole series of, of chemicals, up to 700 chemicals for uh, slickening agents and propants and so on, uh, and also clustered pad drilling to reduce costs. All of these technologies have been developed and brought together to access oil and gas from uh, what geologists call tight reservoirs. In other words, in other words, rock formations where the, the rock pores are very small and the oil and gas just doesn't want to move. There's very little permeability in the rock. And so if you drill a regular conventional oil or gas well in these formations, you get a, an initial little bit of production, but it's not enough to justify the expense of drilling. Mm -hmm. Well, if you drill horizontally, so you drill down maybe a, a kilometer and then angle the drill bit so that you're drilling out horizontally for another kilometer uh, directly into the, the oil or gas bearing layer, then you have more contact between the, that layer and the well bore. So that, that helps. And then uh, using explosive to punct puncture uh, holes in the... Uh, in the well casing and then pumping in three or four million gallons of water at very high pressure wow. uh, containing these, uh, these chemicals. Uh, by doing these things, it's possible to fracture the rock in such a way as to release a lot more of the oil and gas than would otherwise be the case. And, uh, and so that's what fracking is all about. Uh, it, we're talking about uh, rock formations that geologists have known about for a long time but they thought they were too, too hard, too, uh, too expensive to produce from. Uh, and what really made the difference, what, what uh, caused the whole fracking frenzy to, to get going in the last decade was very high oil and gas prices as a result of the depletion of regular conventional oil and gas plays in North America that's been occurring over the past, uh, really, especially the last couple of decades. So when oil and gas prices soared into the stratosphere, a lot of small companies that were willing to take on the risk developed the technology and went after some of these uh, you know, really low-grade uh, uh, rock formations. And you know what we've what we've basically done is develop better barrel scrapers. But but what we're doing is scraping the bottom of the barrel. Mm -hmm. So we really pretty much, because we actually, it was almost 10 years ago, we did a talk, and it was on, you know, the idea of peak oil. Right. And you didn't really start hearing about it for another couple of years, which really astounded me. And I thought, okay, what did we get a hold of a couple of whistleblowers that are just mainly shaking the can, trying to get some attention here. But the truth is it was actually more of a problem than a lot of people believed it is. And we, especially here on the program, we don't try to run out there and find what you would consider to be alarmist, but real people that look into these things just to say, look, here's re what's really happening. You do yourself some good to make some decisions, especially about the habits that you have. And secondly, take the information and look into it further for yourself. And I guess it would be to arm yourself in such a way that Perhaps it's time to do something about it because companies sometimes make decisions that have a tremendous impact on communities, especially when it comes to the environment. And that's a lot of what you're talking about here today in snake oil. Right. 
Right. Yeah, the, the whole peak oil discussion, you know, I think was very threatening for the oil and gas industry because uh, they they saw this as uh, as something that was going to change the way people use energy. If people understand and believe that oil and gas are becoming more scarce and that prices can only go up, well, the natural thing to do then is to start buying a, you know smaller cars to get off of of uh, uh, vehicular transportation altogether. You know, move closer to your job and where you shop, ride a bicycle, walk more, uh, turn down the thermostat. All of these things, you know, these these are not the things that the oil and gas industry wants to see. They want to see more highways, more people. Uh, you know, using their products and using more of their products. So they, they saw the whole peak oil discussion as a real threat. And, and the fracking boom has been their biggest public relations tool uh, ever as, as a way of uh, fighting back against the, uh, the, you know, the, the revelations about how depletion is, is really painting us into a corner in terms of our energy policy. You know, as long as we remain reliant on non-renewable depleting oil and gas and coal, we have an, basically an energy regime with no future to it. And, uh, and you know, we have to do something about that. That's really the, this, this, is, the, uh, this is the challenge for humanity for the 21st century. This, mm-hmm. is, this is really it. You know, if we're going to avert catastrophic climate change, if we're going to have energy to power our economy, we have to get off of non-renewable, depleting, climate-changing fossil fuels. That's the essence of the challenge in the 21st century. But the fossil fuel industry you know, wants to distract us from that in every way they possibly can. You know, Richard, speaking of distraction, here was one that I think is almost heartbreaking, and that is when we had the big BP oil spill down in the Gulf of Mexico. Now you hear, especially this day and age, although it's beginning to wane just a bit, that nice big public relations campaign they have about how they clean the Gulf Coast up and how they've created jobs in the, you know, pretty much the vacation industry down there is thriving. And what's alarming about that is that they've certainly distracted from the fact that they lost a huge lawsuit, I believe it was against Ecuador, for the big natural disaster they created down there. And I think it would be much like, for instance, the gun control laws. And I know I'm kind of taking this in in an interesting direction, but if a gun shooting death resulted in a gun company being held accountable for manufacturing that gun in the first place, it would be really interesting to see how much the tables change, you know, as far as responsibility and should, for instance, people like uh, British Petroleum continue to do what they do, you know, realizing that they are now have had a case which held them 100% accountable for them basically screwing up, you know. Yeah. But the fact is you don't hear a whole lot about that. And I was really amazed at how, Little to no news was given on something like that. And I was watching that one pretty carefully. Because once that happens, it, like, will let you know you are empowered to say, look, I don't think I really want you doing the kind of nonsense that you're doing in your backyard. Maybe it's time for me to make some different decisions about how I get to where I need to go. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, in some ways we're all implicated in this because um, almost all of us use fossil fuels on a daily basis, whether right. it's turning on the light switch or, or getting in the car. But, um, you know, it's, it's also true that the fossil fuel industry bears a, a special responsibility. And as time goes on, the environmental impacts of fossil fuel production and consumption just get worse. That's because... You know, we, we're past the low-hanging fruit. You know, the oil and gas that flowed easily out of the ground that you could, uh, that you could ask, access with a, a cheap oil or gas well that maybe cost just a few thousand dollars to drill, all of that is in the, in the deep past. Uh, the, the whole reason for the BP oil spill in 2010, the Deepwater Horizon, was that the industry was being forced to move 
in out into deep water to drill because all of the cheap, easy onshore oil had already been accessed. Uh, and this is also what fracking is about. You know, again, we're moving toward unconventional sources of oil and gas because the conventional, the easy, the cheap stuff is pretty much already gone. So as we move to the unconventional sources like tar sands, like deep water oil, like tight oil and, and shale gas, the environmental risks and costs spiral upward. And the, the, the public needs to understand this. They need to understand that, uh, that, that if we're going to continue this fossil fuel-based lifestyle, there are some pretty hefty costs associated with that, environmental costs and economic costs. And you know, again, that's, that, that's really why, we, why, uh, why I wrote the book, to, to highlight those costs. Now, let's talk about the cost of doing this uh, versus what the actual yield is. Sure. Well, uh, uh, conventional oil and gas wells uh, may cost, you know, historically, uh, as I said a couple of minutes ago, maybe a few thousand dollars. But uh, these days, a conventional oil or, or gas well may cost a million, two million dollars to drill. Uh, it's it's gotten harder drilling deeper using more sophisticated equipment, but if you're fracking for oil or gas, it may cost you ten million dollars to drill a well. So what do you get for your ten million dollars? You get a a well that is going to begin uh, declining in production almost the day uh, it, it starts uh, producing oil or gas. In the first year uh, after the, uh, the well has been drilled and put into production, uh, the rate of extraction of oil or gas is going to fall by 60 to 80 percent. So the, the, <coughs> excuse me, the driller has to anticipate you know, getting in and getting as much out as fast as possible and then drilling another well uh, to keep keep production going. And this is part of the problem with fracking. The wells deplete so rapidly that companies that, that, that drill for this stuff have to drill and drill and drill. We're not talking about a few hundred wells here and there. We're talking about tens of thousands of wells. So whatever environmental and human health risks are associated with fracking are multiplied uh, so many times over in so many places. And, uh, you know, this is, again, this is what many people don't understand about this technology. It's just it's such a fascinating thing for people to come to find out more about so they make better decisions. Um, is there any ground being gained from people such as yourself to kind of say, look, guys, I don't really think this is the direction we need to go here and, and what they can do about it. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the uh, information that's come out about fracking in the past couple of years has had uh, a lot of impact. Uh, communities have uh, put, up, put up moratoria and bans on fracking within city limits. Uh, the state of New York has a moratorium on drilling Whole countries, uh, like France, for example, and Germany, have uh, enacted moratoria or bans on uh, hydro fracturing. So the, the information is really important, and that's why there's such a war going on uh, between the drillers and you know independent scientists and environmental organizations, because the, really this whole technology is at stake. Uh, the only way it can continue is if information is managed. And, you know, really, in some ways, this all goes back to the very beginnings of this boom. Uh, it wouldn't have taken off in the first place except for a change in the rules that was made in 2005. Uh, it's called the Cheney exemption because uh, it happened largely as a result of the efforts of Dick Cheney, who was then vice president of the United States. Of course, he had previously been an executive of Halliburton Corporation, the world's foremost oil services company. 
So uh, when he became vice president, he pushed through a rules change to the, uh, the Clean Water Act and, and some other environmental uh, laws that uh, said if you're producing unconventional oil and gas in the United States, like uh, shale gas or tight oil with fracking, and you use chemicals, then you don't have to uh, state publicly what those chemicals are. You're permitted to treat those as a trade secret. Now, if, <laughs> if, if, if that hadn't happened, then this whole fracking boom probably would have uh, never taken hold because, the, as I mentioned earlier, there are something like 700 chemicals that are used. Many of them are carcinogenic, like benzol. Others are toxic, like formic acid. And um, you know, uh, when, when drillers use these chemicals, they go into the water, the water goes into the wells, and then uh, there's the potential either for those chemicals to, uh, to contact the water table if there's a problem with the well casing, or later when the water is taken up out of the wells, that wastewater can get into the environment in various ways. And, uh, you know, this, this would never have been allowed if it weren't for our, our, our friend Dick Cheney. Mm. Now, is there a website that people can find out more about this? Well, there are, in, in terms of the environmental impacts of, uh, of natural gas and, and uh, oil production from fracking, there are a lot of websites because there are literally hundreds of uh, citizen action organizations that have sprung up in the last few years. Uh, and it's pretty easy to find those. We have a website that is specifically devoted to the economics of shale gas and tight oil, and it's shale bubble. It's all one word, S-H-A-L-E bubble dot O-R-G. And there you'll find the full text of our uh, report on uh, the 60,000 currently uh, fracked oil and gas wells producing in the U.S. Uh, and you'll also find another report, Shale and Wall Street, that looks at how uh, Wall Street investment bankers have pushed the shale uh, revolution and how they benefit from it. Such fascinating stuff. Snake oil, how fracking's false promise of plenty and perils our future. Our guest today, Richard Heinberg. Richard, please give out that website again for us. That's Shale Bubble, S-H-A-L-E-B-U-B-B-L-E, shalebubble.org. Very good. Richard, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. It's been a pleasure, Daniel. Thank you. you. We want to thank you, the listeners, for tuning in. Be sure to visit us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We have a weekly e-news update for you to subscribe to as well. Thank you again for tuning in. I'm Daniel Davis. This is the Beyond 50 Radio Program. And remember, live your day past halfway.